Although I was convinced that the applicant had made out his case for the for amendment, I was convinced that the non-amendment of his petition would not necessarily be fatal to his case. A review of his petition showed that although he was constrained to prepare and file his petition in only five days, instead of the 15 days he was constitutionally entitled to, he had managed to plead the non-compliance with the principles set out in the law and that Museven Dawina had committed electoral offences. As I pointed out earlier, either or both of the grounds, if proved, would be sufficient for this court, after concluding its inquiry into the petition, to make any of the orders it is permitted to make under Article 105 of the Constitution and Section 59.6b of the Presidential Elections Act. The second reason related to the remaining proposed amendments Having reviewed them from the copy that was attached to the application, <clears throat> I concluded that all the matters, those matters could bro be brought in within the petitioner's evidence. The third consideration that I took into account was the constitutional dictate in Article 104 of the Constitution for this court to conclude its inquiry and to make its decision not later than 40 days, 45 days from the date of filing the petition. Although I was convinced that this obligation did not require the court to refuse a deserving amendment, any time saved by the court without prejudicing the parties would be in the interest of both parties as it would give the court more flexibility to manage the hearing, inquire into the petition, and to render its decision. By 2021, Robert Chagulani made a formal application for extension of time to file the remainder of his evidence. He filed miscellaneous application number four, seeking for the following orders. One, the time granted to the applicant for filing additional evidence in support of the petition be enlarged by one extra day to enable him file and serve all his compiled affidavits. Two, the respondents be given some extra days to file responses. Three, Costs of this application be provided for. On 19th February 2021, this court, by a majority of eight, dismissed the application while allowed it for the following reasons. The application was supported by the affidavit of, uh, sworn by Chagulani and was based on the following grounds laid out in the notes of motion. Uh, one, that the applicant filed the instant presidential election petition on 1st February and served it on the respondents. Two, that the filing of pleadings in his, this petition is still ongoing. Three, the filing of the additional affidavits in their petition is, in, is necessary to enable this honorable court effectively inquire into and determine all questions involved in the petition. Four, they are providing special circumstances that warrant the grant of this application. Five, the applicant has brought this application without any delay. Six, that the respondent shall not be prejudiced by extra time being granted to the petitioner to file and serve the additional evidence in the petition. And seven, that it's in the interest of justice, equity, and fairness that the applicant be granted extra time to file and serve the additional evidence in the petition. The application was supported by the affidavit of Chagulani, where he listed the following additional grounds. And I'll just highlight that on 14th January, upon casting my vote in the general elections, I went back and interacted with our party officials on the progress of the elections, but around 1 p.m., I noticed that my telephone signals had been disabled. Three, that when I and my family woke up the following morning of 15th January, our home had been surrounded by the police and military personnel, effectively placing us under house arrest for the next 10 days. Uh, 
six that uh, I'm reading that when I attempted to move out of my home to seek for legal advice from my lawyers and the decision of my party leadership organs on the next course of action, the police and military officers that surround had surrounded my house refused me from doing so. And there are many reasons um, which are reproduced here in his affidavit. I will not read all of it. Paragraph 30 that I will start with. Twenty-nine. I'll start with twenty-nine. That consequently, the decision from the Chief Justice through the Land Registrar was to the effect that, save for the evidence in thirteen copies of Volume Two, out of which seven copies had been received by five p.m. on fourteenth February, twenty twenty-one, the other copies of evidence would not be received, thus leaving the additional affidavits of evidence under Volumes Three, Four, Five, and Six. Copies of indices of the affidavits in volumes 3, 4, 5, and 6 are here with attached and marked as an exchange E, F, G, and H. Paragraph 30 read that I immediately instructed my lawyers to file this application. But on 16 February, having been a public holiday, they told me that they would file the same on the following day of 17 February. Paragraph 32 read that the additional evidence I obtained from about 200 witnesses across the country is necessary to enable this honorable court effectively inquire into and determine all questions involved in the petition, in first respondent and the third respondent. B. It reveals how results declared by the second respondent were falsified in favor of the first respondent. C. It brings to the to fore the various cases of robbery committed by the first respondent and by his agents. D. It brings to fore the circumstances under which the independence of the second respondent was compromised by the authority of the first respondent abusing the power of incumbency. E. It portrays the audiovisual expression of how the agents of the third respondent selectively enforced the electoral guidelines and used excessive force to frustrate the petitioner's election campaigns in favor of the first respondent. If it brings to the fore the instances of voting in the names of deceased persons and persons out of the country. G, it brings to the fore how the res second respondent relied on an incomplete improper and incoherent voters register in the election. H, it brings to four how the second respondent unlawfully, inefficiently, and covertly deployed a biometric voter verification kit, brackets BVVK, and electronic results transmission and dissemination technology system, in brackets ERDTS, without access by the petitioner and denying him the right to verify voters and audit the results. I, it brings to the fore how the petitioner's stronghold districts slash cities of Kampala, Wakiso, Mukono, Mpiji, Gulu, Masaka, and note the first respondent's stronghold districts of Chiruhura, Isingiro, Bunyangavo, Kazo, Kamwenge, Chankwazi, were the epicenter of intimidation and violence against voters, and how this affected the percentage voter turnout in favor of the respondent as against the petition. 33, uh, I have heard that I state that there are prevailing circ special circumstances that warrant the grant of this application. And in 34, I have heard that leaving out the evidence sought to be adduced would assist the first respondent to commit electoral wrongs and get away with it which has a significant impact on the peace, stability, and democracy of our country. And then he also pleaded that I have made this application without any delay in the circumstances of this matter, 
and lastly that it is in the interest of justice, equity and fairness that I be granted leave to file this evidence. The application was also supported by the affidavit of Wamedi Anthony and I will not go over it. Uh, but I've reproduced it. So, Museveni opposed the application. Uh, in the affidavit, of application is brought in bad faith and an attempt to mobilize the public organs against this court and is an abuse of the process of court. And then he also pleaded that um, they am advised by my lawyers that the affidavits of the applicant are allegedly so details, detailed that the remaining time before trial is not reasonably adequate for the second respondent to comprehensively answer and would be prejudicial to the second respondent and will amount to a miscarriage of justice. In paragraph 24, he pleaded that there are no special circumstances to warrant the grant of this application. And that he swears this affidavit in resolute opposition to the instant application. The Electoral Commission also filed a second affidavit by Bahige, David Mutume, and um, I will not read it in the interest of time, but it's introduced. The Attorney General also opposed this application and relied on the affidavit of Alan Mokama and he also depend um, on the matters which I've reproduced here. Um, but in order for extension of time, even though this was an election matter. The applicant further relied on section 100 of the Civil Procedure Act. In my view, this section was not applicable. However, under section orders 51 rule 6 of the Civil Procedure Rules, there is power to enlarge time and how we, uh, and the, sorry, Rule 5 of the Supreme Court rules provides for power to enlarge time, but Rule 15 of the Presidential Elections Rules does not mention the above rules, and it would, so it would be improper for me to import them here. The applicant further relied on Rule 2.1 of the Judicature Supreme Court rules, and again, as I, I think as I mentioned earlier, they, this, they are not applicable file and serve their pleadings as the case may be and the court has issued new timelines accordingly. The practice of counsel practicing before this court of not adhering to timelines provided for in the law and in the judicature Supreme Court rules and or directions given by the court is regrettable and I condemn it. However, the court in previous cases where counsel failed to abide by the set timelines this court has opted not to penalize the parties for their counsel's failure to meet the either statutory or court-ordered timelines. Instead, having in mind the overriding constitutional principle enshrined in Article 126E of the Constitution, the court has accepted these doc documents filed out of time, even on the day of the hearing, or adjourned the cases to another date to hear the parties. The rationale for, of accepting these documents, instead of declining to grant extension of time to file and serve pleadings not served in time, has been to provide the court the opportunity to render substantive justice to the parties by ensuring that in the matter in dispute, that the matter in dispute is disposed of on its merits and not on technicalities. In Uganda versus Sintambi, Mwangusha J dismissed an application seeking leave to file a notice of appeal eight months 
after judgment had been delivered. I entirely agree with the decision. However, in the case at hand, the record shows that after missing the deadline to file and serve the applicants to serve the applicants council sorry to serve the applicants council took action in less than 12 hours to ensure that the evidence is received and took a day and a half to mark uh, to make the formal application for extension of time it's worth noting that the intervening period was a public holiday, in essence, leaving only half a day to take action. I cite some cases here. Uh, my a decision in Mole Torinawe and another decision to shove a Chris where uh, Nishimi J made the observed as follows, quote, the law creates gates of justice through which people seeking justice pass to reach courts to be redressed. The gates open and close at given intervals in accordance with the rules of procedure. In rare circumstances, gates which are closed may be opened to allow in a late entrant. The application to open or not open is vested in the court. The application before me is one of such rare coming, that coming, restriction unlawful, leaving him with only five days to prepare for his petition and evidence to support his petition. The restriction of his movement was done by members of the security forces and could not have been done without the direct consent and or knowledge of the first respondent, who is not only the president-elect, but also the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, and who appointed the current chief of defense forces and the inspector general of police. Similarly, by virtue of his term of office, he is continuing to remain in office pursuant to the remaining term of office until he is sworn in. The president-elect, as head of the executive arm of government, must have been the one who moved the amendment uh, my other copy had the edits now I'm on, from uh, of the time from 10 days to 15 days pursuant to the recommendations of the Supreme Court. The Attorney General was the chief who is the chief government advisor tabled the Constitutional Amendment Act and the Presidential Election Amendment Act in Parliament less than one year ago. I was very surprised that he could stand up in court and claim that an aggrieved candidate who had only had five days to prepare and file his petition and present his evidence had not been affected by the restriction. Secondly, the argument by the respondents that the period of restriction the court had the court had declined to allow the amendment of the petition and therefore that the ten days restriction was irrelevant to this application was misconceived. Um, by all the three respondents. When the court declined to grant the application for amendment, the court did not give its reasons, and therefore it is not right for the respondents to anticipate court's reasons for declining to grant. It was not right uh, to anticipate the court's reasons for declining to grant the application, and therefore, and to argue as they did. The Attorney General, who was opposing the, uh, the application, uh, sorry, I, I will skip this. Uh, 
um, the applicant's counsel was cognizant of the constitutional mandate requirement for this court constitutional obligation to give its findings and decision within 45 days under Article 1043 of the Constitution. In his submissions, counsel for the applicant was ready to concede two days of their rejoinder to the respondents cognizant of the mandate of Article 104 and Section 1593 of the Act. Indeed, it is true that the enlargement of time for the application to file additional evidence would have had an impact on the roadmap, which had been released earlier and which had and which would require the resp and would require the respondents to file additional affidavits in rejoinder of any new matters not taken care of in their affidavits in the affidavits they had filed earlier. But while this is so, the respondents, and indeed the majority, opted to ignore the fact that when these provisions were enacted and the constitution was promulgated and amended, no one envisioned a situation where a president-elect, who is also the incumbent president, would act through the various organs of state under his control and incapacitate an aggrieved candidate by restricting his movements for 10 days. Therefore, courts should have been cognizant of the fact that Article uh, while Article 1043 of the Constitution and Section 593 of the Presidential Elections Act required courts to declare its findings within 45 days from the date a petition is filed, this requirement did not impose on the court a duty to ignore the unconstitutional and unlawful acts as declared by the High Court to the detriment of the applicant. The restrictions of the movement on the movement of the applicant as pleaded in his affidavit were com and as confirmed by court more than constituted the special circumstances which were envisaged under Rule 17 of the Presidential Elections Rules. It is my firm view that the court could have allowed the application to file additional evidence which was ready on the morning of the 15th February 2021, when the deadline for filing was 5 p.m. on 14th February 2021. The applicant partially complied by filing part of the evidence on that date. Even if they were not able to file the rest by 5 p.m., the fact that they were ready with it on Tuesday 15th confirms the applicant and his counsel's averments in their respective averments that the other volumes were ready. I take judicial notice of the fact that the country is under curfew and the time of the deadline of 5 p.m. Uh, on 14th, the time between the, uh, the deadline of 5 p.m. on the 14th and the curfew time of 9 p.m. would not have been sufficient for the applicant and his counsel to produce the number of affidavits in the volumes required. On directory conduct, um, there is a long-standing principle that has been upheld by numerous decisions of this court that mistakes of counsel should not be visited on their client. Applicant's counsel was not able uh, to deliver all the evidence in the time prescribed for a variety of reasons, some of which were submitted on by counsel Segona. By the majority comp uh, attributing the mistakes of counsel on their client, the court was reversing its decisions without giving reasons. Without giving reasons. I'm aware that by the time 
the court issued the roadmap requiring the applicant to file his evidence not later than the 14th of February, the applicant had had the benefit of the 14 days from the time he filed his petition. But that notwithstanding, the blame that was heaped on him for failure to have produced evidence earlier is misconceived because it's an undisputed fact that he had lost 10 days of preparation time at the instance of the executive, currently led by the first respondent as the incumbent and who had the capacity to give orders or to cancel them. Um, I also for wish to note that this application was heard on 19th February 2021. The application was filed on 17th February 2021 and the applicant gave his reasons for not filing earlier because they were waiting for court's response which came in at 6 p.m. and the following day was a public holiday. Rule uh, 12.2 of the presidential elections uh, petition rules mandates this court in accordance with the dictates of section 59.3 to inquire into and determine the petition expeditiously. The hearing of this application could have been brought forward than was the case. Uh, the applicant cannot be blamed, the delay cannot be blamed on the applicant because he was not responsible for fixing the hearing of the application. In our ruling for disallowing the application for amendment, the court specifically acknowledged that the applicant's petition had grounds, but what was required was the evidence to supplement those grounds. From the application, the applicant was only requesting for one day to file and serve additional evidence, which was ready on the morning of 15th, just 12 hours after the deadline. It's not uh, disputed that the applicant did not file all his evidence in the time he was required to, as per the roadmap, or as per the orders, that's 5 p.m. on 14th February, but it's also evident from the record that the applicant partially complied with the orders and made genuine effort to file his evidence before the deadline expired. And as I've said, this can be deduced from the fact that though they were unable to file the applicant's evidence by the deadline, they were ready with the rest of the evidence in the morning by 7 a.m. on 14th of February. I do not condone the act, the conduct of the counsel for the applicant or even the applicant for failure to comply with the directives of the court. That notwithstanding, I'm cognizant of the fact that litigants and their counsel have not always complied with uh, the orders given by the court in matters currently pending before this court. of the Constitution entrenches the right to personal liberty of all Ugandans. Furthermore, Article uh, 28 also entrenches the right to privacy of a person. In light of these clear provisions of the Constitution and the absence of any evidence tendered by the third respondent, falling in the exceptions permitted under Article 23 and 27, and the decision of the High Court, it behoves my mind that the Deputy Attorney General could rely on evidence gathered from unconstitutional and unlawful conduct of state agents. But even more importantly, that these provisions are, gar are grant guaranteed are granted to all Ugandans. But in this particular case, what was at stake was not just individual rights that are protected. The applicant, having been a former presidential candidate, the petition he was pursuing was a matter of national importance because it has serious implications for democratic governance and the rule of law for this country.
I also took note of the addition, the locking up of the party's offices, uh, and the, that the internet was locked down for several days. The respondents uh, argued that some of the witnesses, the respondents uh, disputed uh, the evidence that some of the applicants' witnesses were locked up and contended that the applicants should have produced the list of witnesses in person. Uh, the list of uh, witness, uh, witnesses of persons who are in prison. And since they did not produce it, they stated that the evidence should not be believed. With due respect to submissions of counsel for the respondents, I found no merit in their contentions. The applicant knows it, his witnesses from whom he needed statements and evidence, and where he needed to access them to obtain evidence to bring to the court in support of his application. The Afida, uh, so the respondents were deponing to matters which were not within their knowledge as they had no basis for refuting the applicant's claims that the applicant witnesses were indeed locked up in prison. Prejudice to the respondents. I need to comment on the contentions which were made by the respondents regarding the prejudice they would suffer if this application was granted. It was very disingenuous on the part of all the respondents to plead that they would all be prejudiced if the court extended the time for the applicant to file and serve the remaining affidavit evidence. He was not able to. The second respondent is a constitutional commission with nationwide offices throughout the country. Similarly, the Attorney General also has nationwide offices. In the petition, he was also representing the different organs of state, such as the police, the army, all who have offices throughout the country. It did not make sense, any sense to me for the respondents to contend as they did that they required their witnesses to be in Kampala for them to file their respective responses to the additional evidence the applicant wanted to file. As opposed to these witnesses remaining at their duty stations whenever they may be, and where any other documentary evidence in rebuttal of the petitioner's applicant's evidence or claims would ordinarily be kept. But if the respondent's environments are to be believed, it should then have been obvious that, that the applicant, whose movements and liberty were restricted, was even more affected and prejudiced in the preparation of his petition and evidence and its presentation, the presentation of his evidence in court. All counsel for the respondents castigated the conduct of the applicant and counsel in the conduct of his case. For the reasons that I've read above, it was, I found that based on the law I have cited, it was, this was a fit and proper case where the application should be granted, and I granted it. I will now proceed to reasons for allowing Chagulani's application to withdraw his petition. Section, um, I will not say much because this application was considered to provides that if a petition is withdrawn, the petitioner shall be liable to pay the costs of the respondent. This is also provided for in Rule 27 of the Presidential Election Rules. Arguing on behalf of Chagulani, Council Segona urged this court not to make any order as to the costs against his client. On the other hand, all the three respondents prayed for the costs of the withdrawn application sorry, petition, to be awarded to them, respectively. With all due respect to the submissions of counsel for the respondents, I disagree with their submissions that the court should award the respondents costs for the following 
reasons. First, I find that both Section 61.4 of the Presidential Elections Act and Rule 27 of the Presidential Election Rules are unconstitutional. By enacting Section 61.4 of the Presidential Elections Act, Parliament assumed a judicial function when it attempted to legislate the award of course to a withdrawn petition to the respondent. Article 104 vests of the Constitution vests in, the, in this court jurisdiction to hear a presidential election petition filed by an aggrieved candidate. It also, the article also vests in this court jurisdiction to inquire into and determine the petition and to declare its findings and reasons. Article 1045 provides that after the court has duly inquired into the petition, it can either dismiss it and declare which candidate was validly elected or annul the election and order a new election to be held. The power of parliament with respect to a petition filed is drawn from Article 1049 of the Constitution, which provides as follows, and I've quoted, this sub-article of the Constitution gives Parliament limited powers as are spelled out in it. It does not, in my view, give Parliament power to exercise a judicial function to award costs to the respondents in case a petition is withdrawn. It's strike law that the award of costs is a judicial function which should be exercised judiciously. The Constitution was very explicit about the source of judicial power. Article 126.1 vests that power in the judiciary as follows, judicial power is derived from the people of Uganda and shall be exercised by the courts established under this constitution in the name of the people and in conformity with the laws and with the values, norms, and aspirations of the people. Furthermore, Article 128.1 of the constitution also explicitly entrenches the independence of the courts. It specifically prohibits the courts from being subjected to the directions of any person or authority. Furthermore, Article 128.2 also directs that no person or authority shall interfere with the courts in the exercise of their judicial functions. The, the Constitution also entrenches the doctrine of separation of powers. Having provided as above with respect to the judiciary, the Constitution also entrenched the independence of Parliament in Article 79. It goes, and I've reproduced it, it goes without saying that the powers granted to Parliament under this article do not extend to making a law directing payment of costs to a respondent in case a presidential election petition is withdrawn. Besides Article 79, Article 50 of the Constitution, one of the Constitution also vests power in Parliament to make laws relating to the judiciary. And it provides as follows. Subject to the provisions of this constitution, Parliament may make laws providing for the structures, procedures, and functions of the judiciary. I'm also aware that counsel for the petitioner applicant did not raise this issue, and all counsel for the respondents did not have an opportunity to canvass this issue as well. However, I take the view that where the court in the course of hearing a matter brought before it, it finds a provision of law contra that a provision of law contravenes the Constitution. It has a duty under Article 2.1 and 2.2 of the Constitution to declare it void to the extent of the inconsistency. In my view, this court is under no obligation to refer such a matter to the Constitutional Court, as it would only be applying the Constitution and not seeking for its interpretation. In Magombe versus Uganda, I stated as follows on this issue. Article 2.2 is a dictate of the Constitution. It does not give, in so doing, expected the court not to interpret the Constitution but to apply its provision. I still stand by the same views. So for the reasons I have advanced above, I find that I'm not bound to order Chagulani to pay the respondents the cost of the withdrawn petition. The unconstitutionality of Section 61.4 of the Presidential Elections Act would by itself be sufficient to dispose of the respective parties' prayers on costs of this application and of the petition as a whole. That notwithstanding, I'm of the view that there are 
two other alternative grounds that support not awarding costs to the respondents. The first is that Section 61 and Rule 27 are declaratory and not mandatory. The operative provisions would have been uh, Section 27 of the Civil Procedure Act, which I have quoted. Unlike Section 61.4 of the Presidential Elections Act, this section rightly preserved the discretion of a presiding judge to either award or not to award costs to a successful party. Hence, this section meets the constitutional test as it preserves the discretion of the presiding judge. But more, the more fundamental reason for declining to award costs to the respondent in this case is the issue of justice and fairness. The respondents argued that in the previous election petitions, this court has handled in 2001, 2006, and 2016, the petition was heard. They contended that this fact distinguished those cases where each party was ordered to pay their own costs from this one which was withdrawn. As I discussed earlier in this ruling, the respondents' prayer for costs to be awarded to them completely misses out the bigger picture about the nature and importance of a presidential election petition in our democratic governance. In Kano Chizavesi Jevasas Museveni, Yoel Kaguta and the Electoral Commission, election petition number one of 2001, Odoki, Chief Justice, articulated this as follows. This is not an ordinary case, but an important case involving the election of the President of the Republic of Uganda. It raises serious constitutional and legal issues, the answers to which and the reasons, therefore, need to be elaborately articulated for future guidance. The effect of the decision on the governance and development of the country and on the well-being of the people of Uganda cannot be overemphasized. Similarly, Justice Mulenga also expounded on this issue in similar terms. This court has established a practice of not awarding costs in presidential elections petition. There was, a, therefore, absolutely no basis for parliament to stray into judicial territory and to make an unwarranted predetermined distinction between withdrawn petitions and those that are fully heard. The established judicial practice in this country is not to encourage parties to continue pursuing litigation for the sake of it. Section 61.4 would seem to encourage that and also legislatively penalize in advance a petitioner who brings a petition to this court in good faith, but realizes midway through the process that it makes sense for a variety of reasons to withdraw it. This runs contrary to, the article, to Article 104, one of the Constitution, which does not qualify the right of an aggrieved candidate to challenge the presidential election result once such candidate believes that the declared winner was not validly elected. Uh, to withdraw the petition, Chagra averred in several parts as follows, and I've reproduced them, I'm not going to read them here. The respondents castigated the applicant and his counsel and dismissed the reasons and the applicant, uh, the applicant had given for withdrawing his petition advanced, I mean, as having no substance. Contrary to the respondent's assertion, I find reasons, the reasons the petition applicant advanced for withdrawing his petition were valid and meritorious. Taking into account those reasons, I find that in the interest of justice in this case, favor an order that each party meets their own costs. Um, there are some other things here I'll, I'll skip. I will now turn to the prayer by the respondents for declaration of first president as the duly elected president. Counsel for the respondents prayed that following the withdrawal of Chagulani's petition, this court should declare that the first respondent was validly elected. Article 1 of the Constitution clearly spells out the role and mandate of this court in cases where it has had the petition 
and completed its inquiry, and those where a petition has been withdrawn. Article 104, um, sorry, 5, provides as follows. After due inquiry, uh, the Supreme Court may and B provides declare I may dismiss the petition, that's A, or declare which candidate was validly elected or annul the election. Um, There must be a mistake here. Because there's uh, article on uh, there's also an article on withdrawal, um, which is very different from in light uh, which which I, I cite here. In light of these clear provisions, I'm unable to grant the respondent's prayer. The constitution binds me as a judicial officer and all the respondents and their counsel to respect it as I have done. Um, I guess that's the, come, brings me to the end of my, um, of course uh, I have a section <clears throat> before I take leave of, uh, of, of this ruling and there are several reasons